This was the sixth attempt on the life of President de Gaulle. In desperation, the OAS terrorists hired a professional killer. His code name, the Jackal. This is a once in a lifetime job. Whoever does it can never work again. How much do you want? Half a million. What? In cash. I'd like to know how you expect us to find half a million dollars so quickly. A desperate plan. Nothing left to chance. Every chilling detail, time to the second. How do you stop the jackal? How do you stop the clock? Commissioner Berthier. We were in trouble on this one, since not even the OAS know who he is. Action service can't destroy him. Territorial surveillance can't pick him up at the border because they don't know what he looks like. An unparalleled manhunt. A determined and relentless killer. Impossible to know. Impossible to stop. Every chilling moment of Frederick Forsyth's sensational book, brilliantly filmed by director Fred Zinnemann. He's vanished. I don't think we really ever had any idea what kind of man you've been pursuing. Uh, excuse me. It's just occurred to me that we've got two days to catch the jackal. Of course, liberation. That's what he's been waiting for. Step by step, with fascinating precision, the jackal moves closer to the moment of kill, to the day of the jackal. Welcome to a brand new episode of Reconsinimation. I'm your host, John Diner. I'm David Munchak. I'm Brent Hutchins. And this is the podcast that takes a look back at some of our favorite films from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And it is our season five finale, guys. How do you feel? Wow. About that? We made it, huh? Five, it's exciting. Five years in the books. Jesus Christ. <laughs> that is incredible. <laughs> I can't believe it myself. We're still here. I think and I've only been here for half of that, but it it you know it doesn't feel doesn't feel like five years. We're down to only sequels left. Uh, we're doing a very Brady sequel. We're doing <laughs> Clueless two. Did that happen? That didn't happen. Not, Not yet. yet. Not yet. Yeah. <laughs> it's well, our no, most it's, it's our most requested one to do though. I don't know. It doesn't quite yeah. make sense. Everybody asks about it. Uh, but yeah, we've had a great uh, year five was very interesting. We kind of started with it with a bit of a slowdown for some outside of the podcast reasons. And uh, we, we, we slowed down the episodes, but we had some big ones. We had Goodfellas, Rollerball. Then we kind of rolled through the summer with uh, what do we have? The Rock. Then we had um, going into the fall, we had Street Smart and we had you mean to actually Jackie remember Brown? these? That's tough. That's I know tough. it's amazing. You could very well be correct. I no <laughs> yeah. I mean, we had Friday Thirteenth Part Seven. Let's not forget that bad boy. We had and six heavy, and seven within the last year. I think Heavy Metal, our first, our first animated movie. That was great. Big Trouble in Little China. I think was probably that was my favorite. That was that was of course a good time. Yeah, bat did you say batteries not included? Don't forget that one. Oh, I didn't say it, but I did not forget it. <laughs> <laughs> and we've of course we uh some of our more recent episodes, we had Extreme Prejudice, we had The Wraith and The Shadow. So a fun spring heading into the end of year five. And we've got a we've already got a kind of a crazy lineup for year six. So uh, keep staying tuned, everybody, and we'll, we're going to have a, a, some fun episodes coming up. But uh, I just want to say thank you to you guys for a great uh, fifth year for the show. It's been you awesome. Mean, it's been a pleasure. You mean us or the, the listeners? Everybody. Oh. You two and our listeners, of course. I am very grateful for you both and for those who who choose to stay with us week to week. And it's uh, it's a it's a wonderful thing. And it's great, Absolutely. you know, uh, our, our audience has been very supportive and, and we've gone, you know, up and up and up, not necessarily every episode, but month to month, we're going, 
you know, up year after year after year. So thank you guys very much for tuning in and listening and, and staying loyal to the show. And we're going to continue our fun episodes. It's amazing. People want to listen to us. It really is. It's incredible. I, I, I thank don't you. understand it, but yes, uh, we have a I mean, good time and that's, that's what, that's what we're here for. So that's true. And hopefully everybody who's listening has a good time as well. Yeah. And with that, uh, getting into today's episode, uh, we are talking about 1973's The Day of the Jackal. Oh, all right. Ooh, was like a werewolf movie? It sounds it's ominous. A, yes, werewolves, mummies, uh, we're, we're talking vampires, all of them come together uh, in the form of a jackal. <laughs> <laughs> which makes sense in and the it's form his, of a jackal <laughs> and it's his day it's, it's, it's all his about day. his day at the mall it's his big coming out day <laughs> just enjoying life <laughs> kind of a, a, a in spirit a sequel to uh to teen wolf right is it well isn't <laughs> yeah. it, it it's its predecessor so isn't i guess it, uh, you're right yeah teen wolf would be the sequel right right you're right <laughs> <laughs> there's no teen wolf without the day of the jackal yeah it's, yeah it's a the, like yeah. the old saying goes, David. You nailed it. <laughs> That's the classic. Of course, they are they are in no way uh, linked or related in in any way, shape, or form. This at least is... this movie is completely different than Team <laughs> yeah. At least on film. At least in the film themselves. Yeah the <laughs> the director's cut might be different, but I um... would I would I would almost wager that this Day of the Jackal and Teen Wolf might be the only thing you could never six degrees separate somehow uh to link them i think I you're probably right. you might be right i'm not david, sure david david i challenge you to find the six degrees of separation you got it uh, right. by the end of the episode we'll have it all right <laughs> let's remember I, to go back to it you got it i think i can do it Fairly quickly, but uh, oh, see, oh, and that's the thing. John could do it off the top of his yeah, dome. Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'll David be clicking through it. IMDb here. <laughs> no, I'd rather you just do it. If you could just do it, that would be insane. I'd love it. I think you could get there. Oh yeah. Oh, oh man. I, there's one movie I can I can link to right away. Really? All right. Well, then I stand down. Let's, so, let's, well, let's well, well, to not. It, it doesn't. Can, I, I haven't fully done it yet. Mm-hmm. I will say, bear with me. My the sound of my voice. I am coming. You know, oh, I've just overcome uh, my first case of COVID. So, got a little oh. COVID brain here too. Oh. Or I yeah, would have solved rough. this mystery already. Oh wow! Uh, well, hang in there, brother. Uh, I love that you said that your first case is though. You, you it's. You, I mean, it's all it, coming in <laughs> as many times as you can get. You can get it. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I'm scheduling the future uh, <laughs> if, future cases of it. Wouldn't so. that be nice if we just si- schedule our sicknesses and illnesses versus at least you know you know what August randomly is going to be a great in the face time for it. So no. August twelfth, <laughs> yeah, or just like all your illnesses for your whole life. Just okay, we're like I'm going to go through like a three year period. Let's just get them all done. Live in misery for three years and then. Uh, like in your twenties, right? And then live the rest of your life till you die. <laughs> yeah. It's like it's like when you get chicken pox as a kid, right? Like get it over with mm-hmm. and then you don't have no memory of it and uh you don't have to worry about it again. At least that's how it works for, yeah, for me. True. I don't know if that's how it works for, for other people. I feel bad for the ones that get chicken pox later in life because I hear it's freaking miserable. Uh they call yeah, it shingles, yeah, you- right? Yeah, it comes, shingles. Yeah. yeah, or shingles is the sequel to Chicken Pox, right? If you well, had, I guess so. Yeah. But it's also sort of. I think it's the adult version. Yeah, right. And that it will mess you up. Yeah, yeah, not good. Um, so don't. Uh, well, ho- hopefully we don't get that. But don't get that anyway. <laughs> so, well, glad you're on the on the upswing there, yeah. Chief. And, um, Thank you. you. Know, just take you sound, take it. Easy. You sound great. Ah, well, I appreciate that. The res the resonance. <laughs> In that the, voice, it's right there. Now. It's there. It's oh, solid. John, what if I told you that Edward Fox was in the 1998 Lost in Space movie with Matt LeBlanc? That should get you there, pretty. Oh, right? that should be Matt LeBlanc to Michael J. Fox. That's got to. That's Mimi was Rogers. It, was Gary it Oldman. Heather Heather Graham in that? Was Heather Graham in that? Heather Graham's in it. Lacey Chabert. <laughs> uh, Lenny James. All the stars. Everybody's in this. Well, you could so. probably link Heather Graham with a P.T. Anderson movie. Could All be. right. 
All it's right. So right. We'll, we'll, we'll get right. back. It's We're happening. Gonna it's happening. <laughs> we'll, <laughs> all right. So the day of the jackal. Uh, this this comes out in May 1973. Brent, what's what's happening in the world uh, around that time? Take us back uh, back in time. Uh, okay, 1973. Lots of stuff is happening. Um, it's a interesting time in the United States. So uh, 73, Richard Nixon is starting his second term as president. Uh, the Vietnam War is is we're pulling out of the Vietnam War. Uh, uh, that happened early in 73. Um, the Watergate scandal broke in 73. So Ooh. Nixon's all over the place. Uh, that broke early 73. And then the hearings and everything that followed afterwards just kind of happened throughout the the remainder of the year. I don't think he was impeached until 74, but hmm. all of the all of the discussions and uh, you know, discovery happened throughout, uh, 73. So that, that was kind of a dark time in our political landscape, uh, you know, up, up to that point, uh, the world trade center opened, uh, in New York city in 73, um, uh, secretariat won the, the Preakness DJ cool Herc created hip hop music. Yeah. So that's pretty well, awesome. Did okay. not yeah. know that. Yep, Led Zeppelin threw a concert in uh, in Tampa and broke the record for largest concert up to that time. It was held uh, earlier. They broke the record that was held by the Beatles. Uh, and then uh, the Dolphins ended up beating the, at least then, Washington Redskins uh, for the Super Bowl championship, uh, Super Bowl Seven, I believe, and... Uh, it was and is the first time that a team has ever <clears throat> had a perfect season. Uh, so that was in 73. Uh, and then uh, movie-wise, The Godfather won the Academy Award. The Exorcist released. Uh, so lots of lots of good stuff happening there. And then uh, Roe v. Wade was going on. And, and that uh, that passed in 73. And Congress or Supreme Court uh, basically banned states from uh or overturned states ability to ban abortion uh which sadly oh. seems to be crumbling these days but uh I, we won't get too much into it because that's not <laughs> what this far podcast is fallen. about <laughs> yeah. yeah uh anyway yeah. states rights man states rights <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right so yeah, man, this is right, you know, right in the first half of the 70s, the glorious 70s and New Hollywood. It's this is my my bread and butter, my favorite uh period in American film history. Uh I love it. And uh and this is one of my new favorites. But uh David, why don't you catch everybody up? What's um what is this film all about? Uh The Day of the Jackal, it's a political thriller based on a fictional novel of the same name from uh, Frederick Forsyth. Uh, Kenneth Ross wrote the screenplay with uh, Fred Zinneman in the director's chair. And it's about a uh, British assassin codenamed the Jekyll, who is hired to assassinate French President Charles de Gaulle in the 60s, uh, essentially for as a, as a uh, revenge for Algeria's independence from France. Um, the film follows the parallel months long journey of the Jackal trying to execute his plan and the investigation and manhunt for him by commissioner Claude Lebel. And that's you what said we... that exactly as they say, as, as he says it in the movie, it's what like your voice was like a spitting image of, of him, of Michael of Le... Lonsdale. Oh, uh, well, you know, Hey, Hey, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't intend it. Um, <laughs> Okay. Well, yeah. So it's uh, it, it it it's a uh, it's a it's a and I'm just now I'm just riffing so you can tell with my stutter is even worse. Uh, but yeah, it's it's an exciting journey over like many months, and it you know and and uh, I, I just love I just want to just set at the beginning like I just love that like time just keeps pushing forward and they, you keep getting these scenes of where real action happens and then. Suddenly, it's a couple weeks later, and there's like little calendars to show you that time's going on. <laughs> like, like this isn't like a week over a weekend. It's uh, it's it's uh, a, a huge, huge uh, undertaking on for both the Jackal and Labelle. Very exciting stuff. 
Yeah, this is, uh, I just have to say, this is like, was a sleeper favorite of mine in recent history. It, this was, uh, this movie is so different. You would never make this movie in this way today. It's so, the pacing of it is so, I, I'm going to say, I'm going to say methodical. It's not slow necessarily because it's, I found it quite fascinating watching, you know, everything play out in the story, but uh, just the style of it is, was uh, just not, they don't make movies like this anymore, but I we'll know. get into me in a second, but what about you guys? When was the Brent, when was the first time you saw this? Is this a first time watch or had you seen it before? This is a first time watch. Uh, I'd heard of it, but I had only really, to be honest, heard of it when the, the Bruce Willis, I don't, I'm not even going to call it a remake uh, in 97 came out the Jackal. Um, that's, that's when it kind of, I became aware that, that this movie existed, but I had never seen it. I don't think we ever watched it in, in school. Uh, and it wasn't really spoken about that much either. Uh, and so it never really landed on my radar in a way that, that I pursued like checking it out until, until recently. So, um, so yeah, first time watch. Wow. Yeah. David, how about you? First time watch? Has first time be. watch. All right, you don't have to predict it. <laughs> <laughs> we know. <laughs> Let me surprise you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, uh, this is definitely um definitely a first time watch. I don't even I think I might have had an awareness of the title somewhere, but I, I didn't know nothing about nothing about it. So uh, you know, I get to go in blind. And uh here I am. Nice. I uh I had never I had never heard of this movie. As being being a big fan of the 70s, this was one that completely eluded me until about e like even factoring in the Bruce Willis Richard Gere 97 version, um I did not know that that was a remake and uh it didn't come to my attention until I'd say somewhere 2010, 2011. And a good friend of mine that I was working with at the time, a friend named Oliver, uh, said, you got to watch this movie. Like, you're going to you're going to love it. You have to watch it. And he, he's like, he brings in the DVDs like it's the day of the jackal. Just trust me. Just sit down and watch it. And I held on to that DVD for probably months, did not watch it. I was like, looked at the cover. I'm like, no, I don't know what this is. Like, just no, I'm not doing it. Huh. Then finally, he's like, come over, we'll watch it together. So I went over to his apartment one night and uh, we watched it and I was obsessed. I fell in love with it right there. <laughs> and he was 100% right. It was totally <laughs> up my alley. I was so, so disappointed that I had dragged my feet for no real reason. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I loved it. I thought it was a, um, you know, such a solid story and great performances and you know all done without really without major stars at the time um and uh i just found it really refreshing to watch but uh and then every time i've seen it since like that hasn't changed so amazing yeah so you didn't you did, yeah it's like these little nuggets of things you don't know that they exist and then they sort of like they rock it up to, you know, this high standing or, you know, your appreciation for the, the art and, and everything. And it's, uh, you know, there's discovery is such a part of this, of this medium. Um, and it's kind of cool. Yeah. Like the fact that you never heard of it and you, by the, that time you were, uh, this isn't, yeah, this I is the era of new Hollywood, but this isn't like a, an American Hollywood picture. Right. Yeah. So this, this kind of flies under the radar for you. Yeah. 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 It's uh, and maybe because it, you know, it didn't involve, you know, it's not really, it's not really new Hollywood, this particular movie, you know, right, right. happens in that during that genre, but it's not considered one of those pictures. So that's yeah. probably why I missed it, that my focus was so much on those movies, the Scorsese's and the Brian De Palma's and the, you know, uh, Coppola's and all that. But um, yeah, uh, but <sighs> assassin films, Let's talk about assassin films in general. What are some of the like popular ones, some of the great assassin films that are out there? Probably what? Like the Born Identity movies, right? 
I mean, Assassins with Sylvester Stallone and Antonio Banderas. <laughs> that's number that's one. That's got to be number one yeah, on that's the a, list, right? That's a sexy one, right? Oh, that that's sexy definitely movie? sexy. It's yeah. got great hair and Julianne Moore. <laughs> Julianne Moore. Uh, collateral. Collateral. I like that movie. Yep. Collateral. Collateral's yep. great. Yep. Michael Mann. Uh, Michael Mann. Uh, uh, I'm going to bring up. Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Well, I was going to just mention the John Wick series because mm-hmm. I am a diehard fan of of the John Wick franchise. Yep, yep. Uh, how about the Professional? Yeah, both versions of it. Yeah, right. Yep. And while while we're at it, La Femme Nikita. I was mm-hmm. going to say Boiling Point, but yeah, La Femme Boiling Nikita. Point. <laughs> yeah, the better version of La Femme Nikita. Fair, fair enough. <laughs> um, the Long Kiss Goodnight. Is she, are they? Is she an assassin? <laughs> <laughs> she just oh, well, I've never seen it. I've yeah. never so good. seen it. It's, Davis. it's been a long time since I've seen it. Gina Davis, Samuel L. Jackson action movie. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I mean, Gina Davis is awesome. I so love Gina Davis. Jackson. But... Yeah. <laughs> Her being uh, a, a, a killer is, is crazy. <laughs> yeah. It's Gina pretty Davis. Awesome. America's Rose sweetheart. Point Blank, maybe? Hey, yeah, yeah. I, I, it's definitely I an assassin. It's definitely there's an assassin, assassin plot. Yeah, there's, yeah. There's, it's it's there. I think it, I think it fits. Probably best assassin comedy movie. <laughs> yeah, probably right. Yeah, assassin rom com. So all oh, of those, you know, all of those films, like I don't think any of them are done quite the same way this is. Especially, you know, your John Wicks and Bourne movies. Like there's. There's such a different breed of assassin and action film than something like The Day of the Jackal. What, like, what entails? What what makes up a great assassin film for you guys? Like, what are you looking for in your your hitman? Oh, for, I forgot the movie Hitman. That's got got to put that up there. <laughs> there you go. Uh, <laughs> what uh... makes up a great uh, assassin film for you personally? Like, what do you like if because it. I know there's people on the on this uh, podcast right now who like the John Wick movies. So, what's what's so great about them? What do you look forward to? Well, I mean, the John Wick movies, kind of. W- what I enjoy most about them is the creative kills and the uh, just sheer madness of of his gunplay. But I initially really liked how they were playing it off as you know kind of a a revenge story right like he's he's lost his wife his wife has left him this this puppy these a-holes come and steal his car and in the in the effort of doing that they destroy his house and kill his dog and he's like happens to be this guy that is a retired assassin who is the boogeyman and nobody wants to mess with. And he goes on a rampage and, you know, like from there it kind of builds and builds and builds to, to the, to the fourth movie. But, uh, but I don't know that I would necessarily quantify that as, as what makes uh, what I really find to be um, kind of the elements needed for a good assassin movie. Cause I think that that's kind of unique. Like, I, I mean, in my, at least as far as I'm thinking, there's not many that I can think of that are revenge stories the same way that mm-hmm. John Wick is. Um, but I think that what makes the the Day of the Jackal interesting and that I like, and to be honest, like most of those movies that, that we named, like I haven't seen many of them in a while, so I don't know exactly if if this plays in, but I like the idea of of understanding the stakes and seeing the process and like the methodical nature that's taken for achieving the goal by both sides of, of the story here, right? Like there's the assassin, right? The jackal. And then there's the, the detective. Right. And they're both like kind of doing the same thing, but in an effort for a different outcome. Right. And I think that that is, is what makes this kind of fascinating. So, I mean, at least that's what I took away from this one. Yeah. I'm with you. You know, the John wick movies sound great on paper and, uh, what's, uh, 
I, I think, but like the good assassin movies is it's it's a both both the assassin and and his foil have to both be compelling and charming that they could carry their own movie because that's what they're doing. It's just usually it's opposing forces. So like you're and you're basically you're rooting for both of them to win, you know, but even though straight up murder or whatever, it's like obviously you don't for the most part, the assassin is a bad guy doing bad things so but it's like at any point you feel like boy he could he could in the typically he could win like the assassin could win and will he and how will he win and and how is his opposition creating those obstacles are there obstacles and uh how does he get through them and and how does he adapt and so yeah the and it just the, the stakes continue to get increased like uh Brent was saying of just understanding the stakes what's happening the opposing forces and all, yeah and usually it's like a parallel action with and sometimes you have like a chase because they get so close and then they get far apart and that could ebb and flow and then this is a gradual like they're they're both starting labelle and the jackal are starting at two different such a great distance and they're just converging like they're getting closer and closer to each other until the till the end like versus like oh labelle got so close to him and now we're going to spend another hour him trying to trying to figure it all out again um you know the the tension is a, it's just a slow boil uh for both of them you know it's a simmer until it reaches a, a fever pitch yeah and we don't even meet labelle until almost halfway through the movie right yeah i mean yeah the whole like what, what i appreciate in in my action and and whether it's you know hitman or assassin movies or whatever it, the case may be we've talked about this many times like i appreciate realism in my action and this is like the perfect example because it's all set up it's all set up and and you could barely categorize it as an action movie because there's what two or three you know moments of action in this movie but it's all it builds to it and is all portrayed so realistically. Like it feels like this really happened or could really happen. Uh, the way, you know, it, it's all about seeing the Jackal set up everything. And some of them, you know, over a period of months. I think process wise. Yes. I agree with you. I think execution wise in this, like the realism falls away for me. I mean, because, it's, is it too real? It's boring. <laughs> no, but I mean, I don't find it real at all. Like in certain scenes, like he does the very seventies Star Trek karate chop to the neck of people and they die. And it's like, uh, well, that was the style at the time. And there's, well, been, that's by the that's way, what I'm saying. there's a little okay. movie, James Bond movie <laughs> called Thunderball with <laughs> the worst karate chop I've ever seen by Connor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's to, what I'm saying is like yeah. that, that kind of like when you talk about realism and action and like that strips that away from me because it's so silly, like in, in, in comparison to, I think more what you're talking about is like, again, the process yeah. of, of like the method in which one would go about preparing and, and planning yes. something of this nature, right? 100%, and so like yeah. that, that part for real, like, and I like the, I mean, you know, I'm not an assassin. I have no idea, but it seems logical. Like it's also what an assassin would say, but <laughs> it, it mm -hmm. seems logical that these are the steps and these are the things that, right. That someone who's trying to hide their identity or get across the border or, you know, uh, S sneak somewhere to 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 kill someone you know like okay these are things that they're gonna do right so that part i i'm all for but like a lot of the execution stuff like and i mean i don't mean execution as in killing but execution of of elements of it uh just kind of tear away at that for me in in certain regards i, so. I can i can tell like the way you that makes sense completely the way you laid it out that um yeah that that is that is something that that changes especially with with action movies over time the style of action and right what you know like a hand-to-hand -hand fight looks like and 
the 1960s and early 1970s and you know into the late two you know 2010s and now like <laughs> totally different and uh it's like the james bond movies like the younger audiences who watch the daniel craig films really struggle with the sean connery and roger moore films sure. because they're so just a different time period you know different yeah. style of filmmaking different style of of action and storytelling in general so I totally get that. Yeah, I think what what I was my intention was more of the you know, I I like seeing the setup and how hard it is to put together, you know, do pulling off an assassination and how do you set up all the pieces that need to fall into place to to so that you can even do it and then get away. Right. And we see it's... him the jackal lay all that out over a long period of time of like setting up his uh, the different identities and scoping out the location and getting his weapons together and getting his exit plan and his wardrobe and hair and makeup and all of that this vehicles everything yeah success for both sides is totally reliant on whoever's ability to best manage the chaos right and it's it's interesting again to see both sides kind of trying to to do that while they each struggle to achieve their their separate goals. It's not important, but it's not germane to anything. But how would he, if he if the jackal succeeded, how would he have gotten away? And they don't. But and it does. The, there's not a lot of setup to those kinds of that. Those kind of questions till you need it answered. So mm -hmm. it wasn't like hey, here's a bunch of information that's useless. Like this is how he's going to get away. But I don't see how he would have gotten away. Like the the lockdown is like intent intent intense. Like well, I think his disguise is so you know is supposed to be so strong, and they're not going to you know right away at least not realize where he sh he shot from. Yeah. So I think it's probably one of those where he could almost wait it out. Like, how would they find him? The, like, there's true. been the whole movie. They never know what he looks like. Yeah, you know, that's they, true. They're on to the car that he drives. That's the only way they're able to track him for a while. Yeah. Well, and they don't they know. It, they know at the end, right? I mean, because he's a uh, certain when, height, certain. Yeah, I think they know he's like fair hair. And well, no, height. when he when he says he's the what is it, the guy from Denmark that's on the train going, uh, he's a teacher like they have they have a photograph of him. Right. I mean, it's on the TV. That's how that's True. how the, the guy. Yeah, that the, lets right. Him into there is a photograph of him, but he's in disguise so often. OK, that, that's fair. I mean, you know, yeah. it's it's going to yeah. still be hard to find him. He doesn't Got look it. like that in his final form, I guess, is, right. uh, you know, he, his hair is back to half, half fair, half gray. Understood. Yeah. He so was, he keeps changing his, his yeah. look enough. Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 He probably would have gotten away with it. I mean, it, but LaBelle was like, there were always like LaBelle was always on the case. Like there was it, it's that circumstance. If he didn't ask that guard at that time. It, he would have, you know, yeah. And, that, and that's like a typical thing is just like, no matter best laid plans, dumb luck will play. In. I mean, it's preparation. Like Lavelle wasn't just happened to walk into the wrong area and just right. like stumble upon it. Like he, he's doing his job and he just luckily in the nick of time, you know, you know, you didn't, you didn't need to see him ask a hundred guards over the last hour about things. Right. You know, it he's was just, there like he's he's, he's right in the neighborhood. So yeah. he's that close to him and he's really that close the whole movie. Um, yeah. And, and just just rewinding a little bit. So the you know, the movie starts with the OAS, which is a terrorist group, uh, at least at the time, attempting to assassinate the French president de Gaulle. And that is unsuccessful. And uh, the you know, the police are on to them and their, you know, their their group is caught or, or you know, certain members who are trying to uh, handle that assassination attempt are arrested, killed or jailed. And and the group that the heads of the group are left with little, very little options of how to how to get, you know, I guess they're going for revenge on de Gaulle for uh, what was it was. Uh, let go and letting go of control of uh, was it algeria yeah algeria was seeking its independence right. and 
and both nations took a you know a vote for it and and the governments agreed to this and then after a post-war kind of situation and a bunch of you know the oas is a bunch of right-wing sort of terrorists who did not want to cede con- that control um to the people of algeria yeah so. So they kind of pool their resources together and hire the greatest assassin they can find to, uh, on his timetable, take out de Gaulle. And that's how, that's how our story starts. And then we follow for almost an hour. We follow the jackal as he's researching and just doing the initial groundwork. I think he knows where he wants to pull it off and it's just sort of working, working the setup and, how how is he going to get to that point in a way that he can exit out mm-hmm. um and then the the uh french government once they they learn of they learn of the plan because they arrest one of the oas's i think assistants right and torture him into you know giving up any kind of information and uh and then they bring on you know their I think they're what greatest inspector in LaBelle played by Michael Lonsdale and uh, to who we see quickly is, is like the Jackal's equal. It's kind of similar to heat with De Niro and Pacino um, kind of like which one, like they're both the best at what they do. Right. Right. Yeah. I think that's right. a good comparison. So, you know, one of the interesting things is you know, there's no major stars in this movie. So the the Jackal is played by Edward Fox, who is a, a huge British actor. Um, and LaBelle is played by Michael Lonsdale, who you might know as uh, the villain from the James Bond film Moonraker. I haven't seen it yet, so I'm looking thought, forward to that. I, I thought that was Jaws. <laughs> Jaws is in Moonraker, but... Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, well, we're working our way slowly through the Bond movies, so we'll we'll get to Moonraker. It's not one of the most beloved uh, Bond films, but um, is it not? I remember liking it, but I, I loved it as a kid. Haven't, but haven't seen it since I was probably twelve. It it was definitely James Bond's reaction to Star Wars. Got it. Oh, well, that's what the world needed. Yeah. That's yeah, exactly. <laughs> the book is nothing like the movie, like many of the James Bond books, but uh, well, the movie yeah. was, we got to get James Bond in space with some lasers. So how are we going to do that? <laughs> <laughs> got to get Roger Moore out there, but um, Michael Lonsdale also appears uh, much later on in Ronin, which is probably a movie we'll cover on this show at some point. Big fan yeah. of that one. But uh, I love the performance of, of both these actors. I think uh, they're just really fantastic. And I, I think because they're not stars, um, it just feels more believable to me. You know, I'm not mm-hmm. distracted by their star power. And hey, because that is a factor. And when you're watching Heat, like you're seeing Pacino and De Niro, too. You're seeing yeah. the characters, but you're also seeing those actors. It's unavoidable. Yeah, I could see that. I mean, there are elements of this that, and and not having any recognizable actors, and it might have fed into that, that felt very documentary-esque to me, like some of the narration at the beginning and, and things like that and the setup. Um, but I would say as much as that, may have benefited in one regard. I I feel like also not having recognizable people in some of these parts also for me hurt it a little bit because I found some of the scenes and some of the characters confusing because there were so many, I mean, there's so many scenes of people just in a room and all these people in a room. And, and it's like, I don't at, at a certain point I'm like, okay, which group is this? Mm-hmm. What people are these? Is this OAS? Is this yeah. like the French? Like I, it, it became a little confusing. And so like, if there was at least one sort of, because they all look kind of the same, they're all smoking <laughs> cigarettes. Yeah. They're wearing they're suits. All, they're, they're all 40 plus. Pipes. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, ah, uh, they all look almost exactly alike. To they're me. all white. They're all white well, too. All uh, right. you know, it it really is like, boy, they uh, white people do look alike, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. And I, so like, they, 
<laughs> for me, if they would have had at least one recognizable person in the group, you know, like I'm not saying that that the Jackal needed to be someone famous or that LaBelle needed to be someone famous, but just the group, like some sort of secondary player that was recognizable. I would have found it a little less confusing because it was, it, I was having a difficult time at, at certain parts, like kind of keeping track of where I was. Yeah, it's, I can, I can understand that. If uh, I could see these, you know, the, the additional characters, because pretty much you have just really just the Jackal and LaBelle outside mm -hmm. of that. It's, uh, it is a little difficult to track like who are these you know I, I don't know you know these characters names and who are they and exactly like who do we care about and why should we so i, I can understand where you're coming from yeah. i mean even I, all the ladies look the same too you know like i was just yeah. like, same haircuts like same look i was just like man like everybody just looks like a carbon copy <laughs> it's very difficult to to figure out who which part of the story they were trying to support at certain times because because of that it's a it's not i mean it's not but it's like it's a very like sort of earth like brown earth tony kind of movie right. you know movie like everything and the style of clothing is all you know all these sort of darker colors and suit everyone's in suits and and again, like everyone's older, like and without standing out, and you know, there's so many yeah. like so many ancillary, you know, so many like supporting characters that don't even have lines, but then they're mixed in with like characters who have lines, and it's just like, all these bodies in a room. And uh, yeah, I mean, I could have used a Dennis Hopper in here somewhere, <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, something <laughs> like just being like third tier, like under, you know. If you throw a know. Gene Hackman in here, just forget about it. Hack, it's I Hack mean, and Hopper. This ball. movie reminded me a lot, and I have to I have to imagine that the, the conversation was influenced by this movie. Like I found a lot of parallel, like at least from the like I don't know, the overall sort of uh, feeling that the, the movie was was presenting. Um they they seem very similar to me in that yeah. in that regard. Yeah, I can see that like the the there's a level of tension that you know you know you know it's all going to come to a head at some point yeah and i mean it makes kind of sense to me i mean they both came out relatively close to each other i yeah. think i think the conversation was 74 right but they're going to be influenced by kind of the same political and world yeah. things that are that are happening so absolutely so why would they not I, I gotta tell you, watching i don't have to but i watch everything with closed caption on and that just helps me track for the me first too. time watching a movie like character names and like yeah, that's you, a good idea it, it really because you're just seeing the word like it infuses it in your brain like i'm easily recalling labelle but i would have had to like i would have known who he was but i would have checked imdb before we started recording to be like what's his name again and it's LaBelle, yeah. like you know what i mean um so it, sometimes that close captioning really just can it, for a first time view very helpful i um, i i watch it like that way all the time ever since yeah. i had kids it was just uh it was yeah. very much needed and i think i think there's a large contingent of people that watch things with closed captioning and they they found it's easier to sort of consume oh, yeah. what they're watching i think well and and i think i have a hard time as i'm getting older with like hearing the dialogue you know sometimes it's accents like i, I like what did they say? I, I I couldn't actually hear it. And now with with closed caption, it's just there. It is. I get it. You know, boom, boom, boom. Yeah. So accessibility is important, everyone. True. M multiple multiple pathways to uh, understand the movie. Kind of, uh, closed captioning is one of them. Anyway. Uh... <laughs> so going back to the story, did you find watching it? you know for the first time for both you guys did the story make sense or was there any spots that was sort of muddled for you not talking about the care you know the characters which we just talked about but like the actual beat to beat you know telling of the story yeah i think i think so because it it this isn't like a movie where I'm like, well, what's what's the jackal's origin or what's his true motivation? Like his motivation is money. He he does what he has to do. You don't have to really give a, you don't have to care about 
him other than his mission and like being laser focused on his mission and same thing with labelle they're both it's just like here are the mission objectives for both and um i i and i don't i'm not smart enough to see maybe where some of the if there's if there are logic holes other, other than me saying well what was his exit plan but again we'd only know it we'd only know it if he got away with like if he actually got the assassination off it's that's the way the the narrative is always portrayed we see what his reaction to things are and what his plan always was and how he does it so it doesn't matter that's just me being curious yeah so um but otherwise like everything sort of seemed to make sense even if it might be a little hard to track because if you're not exactly sure who wait, where did that one detail come from? Right. But you just sort of accept that like, okay, that funneled up to the proper channel. Like I forgot that the like halfway through the movie, I was like, wait, how did they even get his name again? It was like the guy who said it on the recording. Oh, that's the guy that they put in front of a firing squad. Yeah. Who they tortured. But it took me a minute to realize like, boy, if they just didn't torture that guy, he would have got away. With, like no one would have ever known. Like, um, so that like, but again, it's my first time viewing it, and I think you just sort of trust the, the 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 forward momentum of the narrative to take you there. And it's not exact. There's no. And looking back, I don't think there's any holes. I'm not. Uh, but I mean, I don't know. Am, am I yeah. missing anything? I mean, it, it all it all made relative sense to me. I think I missed something somewhere though, as as far as like how Labelle originally got on the on the trail of the jackal but but it it was pretty fleeting and and everything kind of connected quickly after that but i i wasn't exactly sure how those dots got connected um so but other than that like I, there's no like any great leaps i i i feel like i feel like it's pretty well buttoned up I think it's also a movie that on multiple viewings it you can see because there's so much setting up happening and you don't know where like why is he doing that or when it's going to pay off and mm -hmm. um so I think watching it a second time or even a third time like a lot of that stuff is like oh that's how you start connecting those dots a little easier but yeah. um which I I kind of like having had that that I, I think mm -hmm. that's smart movies do that um well and i think it's very and it's and it's particularly in modern hollywood movies where if if the plot may be the plot and the details are a little too dense they they insert some incredulous some characters incredulous what do you mean there's going to be an assassin where oh but i don't like someone doesn't believe what's happening so another character has to explain no trust me this is really what's going to happen to so they have to base so they tell the audience twice like hey, okay here so you can follow so there's a lot of hand holding on that way yeah versus like just trust trust what the story is telling you and these characters are competent so they're just going to go forward instead of giving a favor to the audience and it's just like some sometimes i watch these movies where like some here's the inciting incident and then for some reason there's a one character who just like i don't believe it or i need convincing and it's like okay we're gonna tell you the whole thing all over again dummy and then and then the audience can say oh yeah you know what and i'm now i agree with the hero and that character you know, is a, is a, is an idiot. And if they die later, I I'm justified in not, not caring, you know, like yeah. versus like if any of the heroes of the movie died, uh, you know, you're, you're sort of like, Oh man, that, you know, the jackals jackal keeps winning. Like, but, and you kind of want the jackal to win. I'm conflicted is really all I'm saying. <laughs> well, in, in modern, you know, a lot of modern action movies, you know, things come too easy. Yeah. You know, there's yeah. a lot of plot devices that are just, you can tell, are just thrown out there to, like, force the plot forward or just to make it a lot easier for the audience to understand, like you were just saying, David. Yeah. And here, you know, this is much more of a a thinking person's, <laughs> you know, assassin film that, that you, you have to work for it. You have to, like, stay up with the story and you have to really listen and pay attention to what the characters are doing in order to... uh stay with the, the story but i uh there's a couple of subtle details that i really really appreciated watching uh on, on this viewing but labelle seems very you know when we meet him he's what he's caring for his birds or his pigeons right that he's you know that's yeah. like his 
hobby. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's like, is he retired? Are they bringing him out of retirement or is he, do they really just bring him in on special cases? Um, but he has got a very particular setup of how he wants like his station to be. And um, I think he mentions like antacids or something. There's a whole kind of, I don't know, I, just the characterization of him that he's got maybe an ulcer or stomach issues the whole time. And it's just like, like he knows how stressed he's going to be mm -hmm. through this whole process. Cause there's so many scenes where he's like coming out of the bathroom or going into the bathroom at the end of that scene. <laughs> it's just a very subtle character device that uh, I thought ideas. was really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe he's taking Alka Seltzer. Uh, yeah. At one point, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just thought that, that was a really cool, uh, you know, character piece. Yeah. And the, you know, the jackal who pretty much kills quietly or not, you know, everyone that he's interacting with along the way, like everyone he's getting his supplies from, I'm pretty positive he's killing them as he goes. How did he kill the, the gunsmith? Well, that's the one, that's my favorite one because you don't see it. He just, when he gets, he gets the gun, when he goes, because he meets him and then he goes back He's later. Like, Let to me pick see up one of those bullets. Exactly. Yeah. He asks yeah. for one of the bullets and he's holding it. He holds it with a handkerchief. Mm -hmm. yep. And that was it. And then we cut and we never see the gunsmith again. Okay. Yeah. You yeah. could, you could argue that he lived, but there's, but the pattern would see that. And, you know, the, and when the forger, you could see he might have been motivated to kill him because the forger was asking for more money and 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 um and right. trying to extort him but he was probably going to kill him anyway <laughs> yeah well because well, nobody you know he's i i think arguably supposed to be the the world's greatest assassin right like no one yeah. knows what he looks like no one knows who he is i guess except for these oas people who mm -hmm. somehow knew knew to contact him um but nobody we we go through this whole movie and we never know his name Right. The jackals are the code word that right. he made up for himself, uh, but we never we never know his actual name. We think we know it the whole time. Well, yeah. and that's like the last question they ask in the movie. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Who was he? Yeah, we think his name is Charles Calthrop, and then at, in one of the last scenes, we see the real Charles Calthrop throw, uh, sh shows up at his apartment, and yeah. you realize like you never know who he was. Uh, well, it was it was actually inscribed on the the uh, coffin, Scott J. Howard. So <laughs> leading, another directly connecting to Teen Wolf. So correct. Yep. <laughs> there there it is. A, That's a, the connection. A descendant. Yeah. Uh, Got it. An ancestor. Well, I, I see. I like. I am wrong. <laughs> He's Scott Howard's great grandfather. <laughs> it all ties to Teen Wolf. Here it goes. Uh -huh. But no, yeah, we never, he, he is a nameless assassin and who is buried in unmarked grave um, by the end. So whoever he was, he'll never be heard from again. And, and who's the know. one, one person at his, uh, at his uh, grave site at the end? LaBelle. 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 Yep. Yeah. Really, uh, Really interesting characters. I think I think that's part of why I really like watching this movie. You know, on multiple viewings, is that I I just like watching Edward Fox as as the Jackal and Michael Lonsdale as as LaBelle. I just I find them fascinating uh, characters. Yeah, yeah, great performances from both. So this was actually based on a uh, a novel which was written uh, right around the same time, right written in 1971 by Frederick Forsyth, which I think you mentioned that David. Mm -hmm. um, the in the book, the book kind of breaks down into like three parts, which is the anatomy of a plot. It's called where it's sort of the build up with the jackal, the anatomy of a manhunt, which is where we follow LaBelle's storyline and tracking the jackal. And then Anatomy of a Kill, which is sort of the finale all uh, happening at once. So you know, I think the movie is structured pretty closely to that. I mean, it's not as obvious breaks or anything, but uh, story structure is basically yeah. the same. I think in retrospect, it, it, it actually follows that pretty, pretty well. Yeah. 
And the the assassination attempt in the beginning of the book, which I think is pretty close to how the movie plays out, it actually did it. Uh, you know, that attempt did uh, happen in 1962. So I think that uh, part is based off reality. That's the opening assassination. Yeah, yeah, the, the failed attempt. All oh, right. Which is kind of a cool scene. It's just like you see them, you know, these guys who are obviously you know, they're standing there with machine guns, like hiding on the side of the road and De Gaulle just <laughs> comes through and the driver just maneuvers like around. <laughs> yeah. And I like how the narration, when they pull into their destination, the narration's like, and nobody got hurt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Not matter even of fact. the driver. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and it went, uh, it went into pretty quick development. It's part of a, ended up, ended up as a part of a two picture deal between uh, Fred Zinneman and John Wolfe, who's a, a British producer and uh, Universal. So uh, the studio wanted a major, you know, major stars in this movie. They were going after Robert Redford. They were going after Jack Nicholson as, as the Jackal and uh, Fred Zinneman, who, you know, was a major, major director uh, by this point. He had directed High Noon, From Here to Eternity, Oklahoma, A Man for All Seasons. So big, big movies. And uh, he kind of held his ground and he wanted a British actor, uh, you know, a, a non-star as the uh, as the Jackal. And he was going for Michael York, who uh, we all know from Austin Powers, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, David McCallum, Ian Richardson, and of course Edward Fox, and uh, that's who he ended up with. What was the other picture in the two picture deal? Do you know? Uh, I don't think it ever got made. I'm oh, not really? sure what it was, but yeah, I don't think it ever ended up getting produced. Happening. Hmm. It happens, you know. Yes, it does. Uh, and Fred Zinneman was a, a big risk t- taker with you know the the type of stories that he was telling. Um, he would go out, you know, he's one of the first directors to go out on location and get out of studios. So it uh, feels like the right guy for the, the job. Going back, an- another story point I really uh, dug was the um, LaBelle realizes, you know, part of the way through that someone's feeding information to the Jackal, that oh, yeah. the Jackal, how is he able to stay a step ahead of them the whole time? So someone's got to be giving him information so he um you know he reveals that he's bugged you know the person who's been feeding information who was uh you know one of these cabinet members that um was doing it and was having an affair with uh someone who was connected to the oas which was you see that set up very early in the movie this woman who kind of initiates a a relationship with uh, this cabinet member and you know once once labelle reveals that this person you know he plays an audio recording of this guy's girlfriend and the guy knows immediately like he's caught you know it's him he didn't do it personally but uh so he you know resigns and leaves the room and we later see he's committed suicide but uh i love the reveal of that he tapped he didn't know which one of them it was. So he tapped all their phones. Yeah. Yeah. That's the way to do it. Yeah. And that was like, I mean, they, they couldn't argue with him there. He, yeah. They he proved himself right. Mm-hmm. Yep. What do you think about the Jackal's relationship? So along the way, the, the Jackal kind of encounters this woman, uh, Colette de Montpellier at, uh, one of the you know a, a hotel you know uh, along in the countryside how do you feel about how that relationship played out it's really like is it the only time we kind of see into his humanity a little bit what aspect of that relationship do we see into his humanity well just that he you know i don't i wouldn't say he falls in love with her but i think you can tell he's got feelings for her there's no need just, for him to have a relationship. I think he her. just wants to bone down. Yeah, isn't <laughs> like, he just isn't he just using her? I mean, he kills her later. Yeah, but I I, I read that scene as he didn't want to kill her. Yeah, he, he it, killed her because you know she, Labelle caught up with her. You know, in in, tra- in following the jackal, he realized you know he was interviewing people at the hotel and they had had 
an affair and he puts that together pretty quickly um and when she tells him that the police came to her he has no choice he murders her right there and in like two seconds you don't even see how he kills her like he, she doesn't he even chokes, struggle he yeah he, he either breaks her neck or quietly chokes her yeah you see yeah you see yeah, his hand yeah. on her neck but like she dies in sec like sec without even a struggle like she's dead like it's, it's, yeah that that's good. another it's well that's another one that breaks the whole realism for me as well as him just like walking into her room and it's like it totally yeah. i didn't get i didn't get the sense that she was like necessarily expect him to come visit but he did she left, she left the door unlocked yeah well, they all she was secretly hoping. I mean, they I, also I, left all their shoes outside. I, I feel like it was just a different time where maybe they didn't <laughs> lock the I doors. Think, but... I think it was one of those that she wanted him. And that's why she leaves the door unlocked. And if he didn't come, he didn't come. But if he did, the door is open. See, for me, like I read that whole situation completely different, just in just in general. Like I I I think that her chateau was on the way of where he needed to go. He needed, he knew he was going to need to, to change his uh, look again. And he was going to need a safe place to, to be and, and likely a, a new ride at a certain point. And so he used her uh, for, for all of that. I, I just, I think it's interesting. I mean, everything else, that he did within the structure of the movie was so methodical that for me, like it just read more like she was just another pawn in his research and understanding where he was going to be and where he was going and how he was, he was going to get there. Well, that's the thing about the Jackal. We'll never know. Will we? Yeah, we won't. Yeah. He was learning things about her and then, but he didn't, she wouldn't, she wouldn't reveal at all. And he had to check the hotel ledger or the hotel uh check-in book to find out her real address and that's where you know because she was she was lying to him about certain like she wouldn't reveal any everything so, right. right but he he knew what to glean from her so yeah i i'm with you on that brent like it was like you know and plus he you know and he's getting his rocks off at the same time like it's yeah uh, you know and i mean so, he was heading he was heading that way anyway right like yeah so it's all a manipulation there's no yeah, yeah. You know, he's you know i yeah when you're with uh with the lady uh that's your most vulnerable i'm sure there's some level of his humanity but that's that, that's not the story that the story isn't in, interested in really telling that it's just right. sort of like it's a different way to to show his ruthlessness and um uh, and and yeah. cunning um yeah that's what i i read i read it more like yeah. like that yeah what did, poor lady um... Yeah, poor, yeah. poor lady. Poor lady. Wrong place at the wrong time. And if she just, you know, she, she, and she, but she really liked him enough to say, cops, cops came, came looking for you and you can trust me. Just tell me. Like, I'm, you know, and that was yeah. it. Like, she signed her death sentence. Death sentence. Uh, yeah. I really liked the, um, his choice of weaponry too. That, that gun. The weird gun? Yeah, it's like so thin and small, and and it's just uh, a, like a skeleton gun. It is it is single purpose, and it is not over engineered by any means. Yeah, yeah. very very simple, and uh, but I like seeing him, you know, test it out. That like you know he's got to work the sight, and it's off. You know, you see him shooting, yeah. and you can tell how far the sight the, is off. And that's the only scene that I recognized from the ninety seven version. Yes, as well. correct. <laughs> The guns are totally different, though. Yeah, yeah. But uh, you know, it's just 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 sounds like almost like a silencer, right? Like this little. Well, it is. I mean, he specifically requested that I have a silencer on it. Yeah. Yeah. And but this this explosive bullet that uh, you know you can only imagine what that's going to do to a person. But if you want to know, you can watch the 1997 version because we see Bruce Willis do this with a very young Jack Black. Well, he shot the he shot the policeman that ran into the into the apartment with LaBelle. Yes. Yeah. So you can see what it does. It didn't do much, but the machine gun that LaBelle used certainly uh tossed well, him up ten feet in the air. <laughs> tossed, yeah. him, tossed him 
what looked like about to be through the roof. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's um, talk about that, that ending. Um, you know, as we talked about LaBelle is like hot on his tail, then loses him. Then he's hot on his tail. Then he loses him again. And, and at the end, right when the, the event is going to happen where De Gaulle's going to be assassinated, the, you know, the jackals lost again. Like he's, He's in disguise. He talks his way past a guard into this apartment that that he set up way earlier in the movie. Uh, that this is where he's going to do this, and uh, which you don't realize till you get to the end that that's mm -hmm. what that is. Um, and then, like you guys were talking about earlier, Labelle is he's right in the neighborhood. He's he's asking any any the cops, you know, if they've have you let, let anybody, anybody buy. So this one, you know, guard has let through a, a wounded veteran through, you know, because what he's sympathetic to him. So he lets him through. Uh, well, and, and he course, says that his, this, his apartment's right there, right? Right. Like, he's like I live he right here. Proof. Right. He's got the proof and yep. he's got he the papers. Yeah. Certainly doesn't match the idea of a, of an assassin, a one-legged guy with crutches, you know? Right. Like, yeah. And so. LaBelle realizes like that's the only person it's, it's gotta be that person. He's that yeah. good at the disguises. So, you know, he and the, he and the cop run in and, <clears throat> and uh, the jackals just loaded his first bullet. Cause I think he can only load one at a time and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you know, spins to the door only has time to get one shot off, but it's the young cop who's in first who takes it. And, you know, as he's trying to reload LaBelle grabs the, the officer's machine gun and just is beats him to the draw. Yeah. And it's like that. It's like all the whole movie builds to this action scene that happens in what? 10 seconds. Yeah. Well, yeah. and he had, he had actually taken a shot at the goal first. Oh yeah. And, oh, that's right. And the goal, bent he bent over right at the time and the little explosive bullet goes, Pew! <laughs> and yeah. then, and then that's when LaBelle and the police officer run in as he's loading the second, bullet in he turns and and shoots the police officer and labelle uses the police officer's gun to yeah and in an extraordinary fashion i think they used some wire work there <laughs> a little bit a little it bit it looked of like work. some wire work yeah <laughs> yeah it was you could see him jumping off a train yeah it was yeah. quite impressive yeah uh, and he hit the wall hard like the whole wall <laughs> shook like yeah. he was just like oh yeah okay yeah that, that that gun had some thunder yeah and then just like that it's uh it's all over and labelle's you know caught and killed the jackal yes although Oof. never never knowing who he actually was yeah no no nope. well they nope. knew they thought they knew who he was at that they, point because right oh yeah right it wasn't until the next scene that the the actual Cal Charles uh, Calthrop shows up. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I don't know. I overall, like I, uh, I just really appreciated all that slow buildup to that quick, quick payoff. Uh, the, to me that worked really, really well. Yeah. Agree. Cause yeah, no matter how smooth and, 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 uh, that, uh, the jackal is, you know, he again obstacles hit him at all at all turns. He's got to work his way through it, and uh, it just came down to having to kill that that guy. If if Labelle was the first one in, he would have died. Yep. <laughs> like, and yep. the cop probably would have shot him or tried to you know try to take custody of him. Um, that cop would have never killed the jackal. He would have shot and missed and probably yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's <laughs> never gonna happen. <laughs> Um, it'd be interesting to get a remake of this movie, not from 97. That wasn't like, Oh, I mean, 97, all the movies were like great, but also like well, how, here, how big and crazy can, can some of this be uh, 97? That was the year of, uh, Con air and yeah, face yeah. off and how, yeah. how, how Michael Bay can we go? Right. So, right. Um, it's, you know, I, I really, I, when it first came out, I really liked the Jackal, but that's, you know, not having known anything about this. I've seen it since, and it does not, does not age well at all. I, I was, 
half tempted to watch it again, but I didn't get around to it. It's it's very different, and you can tell it's really built as a vehicle for uh, Richard Gere and Bruce Willis. And you know, at the time, you didn't really see Bruce Willis as a villain that often, so it was kind of cool to see him with mm-hmm. the tables turned and as the you know as the killer there. Uh, like I said, it's got a very young Jack Black. Um, it's uh, and and also a very young J.K. Simmons, I believe, is in it. He is in it. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. And Diane Venora from uh, from Heat is in it as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it's just story wise, it doesn't come together that well. It feels forced. Um, it doesn't have any of the kind of nuances that this one has. It's completely different. It's got you know Richard Gere's like an IRA you know member who's been in custody, who's released to you know work with you know, the FBI or whoever to, to find the jackal. Oh, yes. Use a killer to catch a killer. Exactly. Yeah. So, Ugh. Yeah. and, 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 and he's just a little too cool and smooth. Absolutely. And he's, yeah. you know, got a real thick Irish accent in, in the film. But I mean, imagine, imagine, you know, like, I mean, you mentioned it earlier, this is very heat like, right. So what if Michael Mann were to take a, a stab at, at oh. directing a, a remake of the jackal? I, I'm know? totally in. Yeah, like it, it would be it would be pretty compelling and interesting. And it would be nice to see this movie updated uh, in a way that that kind of cleaned up some of the elements that were less realistic. You yeah. Know? Uh, yeah, I I would definitely be down for a, a, a remake of this. Um, you know, keeping it I, like I don't think I need to have it modernized either. I mean, modern style wise, but not right. necessarily like. Keep it, keep it set in the, you know, in the, what, whenever it was the late sixties or 60s, early seventies. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, keep it set there and, and, you know, tell this story without all getting techy. you know, now yeah. it's like, there's so much email tech have, involved. Email would have solved a lot of problems. <laughs> yeah, well, sure, sure. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we have a picture. It's going to, you know, it's like, literally, if you don't, where do you, how do you get a copy of a picture from another country? Oh, well, they got to yeah. send it to you. Like, yeah. yeah. You know, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's one thing. That's one thing this movie also made me realize is, man, it, information, can. information, trans, like the transfer of information and the efficiency we've gained since the 70s is incredible. Yeah. No, that, that wild. Like, yeah, really. I, uh, I would, I would still venture to say that a lot of, uh, uh, maybe political, uh, or, or, police i don't know what what i'm hmm? like the fbi they still i still have visions in my head that they still struggle with with some of the communication inefficiency <laughs> like they're still working in triplicate like i have this like <laughs> i still have this like image in my head like i was watching this movie and i was like oh man i'm so glad we've cleaned up how to communicate quicker but i was like i wonder if they still struggle with this in in some of those other bigger uh like federal law type things probably it, you know, I'm sure, there's some bureaucracy. Probably not, but like it, it seems like there's, some of it was. Pretty there's funny. definitely more than a few fax machines still floating around there. Yeah, well, it's also <laughs> like you got to communicate it to this guy who communicates to this next guy. It's like yeah. you don't just. There's like three points of, of telephone that go on to communicate like one bit of information instead of just like going from, a a to a to z, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So overall, how did you feel like the Day of the Jackal held up versus, you know, your more modern action films and and uh, assassin thrillers? You know, it's a it, it's a great product of its time, and I think and holds up very well um, without any kind of issue. That, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know, maybe you could add a little more interesting uh, action instead of simple judo chops that that Austin powers judo chop and that's you know, exactly yeah but like it's it's not it's not even that necessary it, it it's kind of a shorthand for like he's always gonna win so he just yeah like you don't have to get into a a fight where he's even struggling that's what like and i keep saying this about action movies we're like oh the hero struggles sometimes like when tom cruise can't exactly beat up the guy and he gets his ass kicked half the time and he eventually wins. But at least you're seeing that struggle. And I, I like that element. But I, I think be, this, but 
you don't unless you were to change the character uh in in the remake like you know i i kind of like the idea that he he struggles in his own way but the murdering is not what he struggles with you know right. he, he, he like and he and he's got skills but it's not like well he just does it like we have to watch him methodically well now he's gonna paint the car you don't have to watch the whole process but he had to set up the you had you saw that he knew how to like perfectly tape up the car yeah um he knows how to yeah. work the under underneath the car to hide the the gun he knows you know he knows how to do stuff and you get you watch him struggle or not struggle but watch him go through the process instead of like everything's easy and he's too cool for school like that's this is yes i like this a lot and there was I, no like hanging out of helicopters like shooting at you know shooting up things either yeah we didn't, we didn't have any of that it, and, I mean, and like i think there's a place for those kinds of thrills and excitement but like i don't want to see the tom cruise version of this movie like no i, I want to see care. the tom cruise version of mission impossible yeah that's, yeah, that's what right. tom cruise that's the tom cruise world he needs to be in yeah yeah yeah, yeah. he shouldn't play the jackal but michael mann should definitely direct the remake of the jackal <laughs> <laughs> yeah so. um yeah, I, uh, you know, as I mentioned, I, I appreciate this story. And yeah, maybe it's not, you know, completely, uh, completely flawless as far as the, you know, the, what we, the action that we talked about. But, you know, as a story structure and the storytelling, uh, I, I appreciated this a lot uh, today. So um, I really, really enjoyed it still. Yeah, I liked it a lot. I thought it was... I'm bummed that I hadn't really seen it before. So, you know, I thought, I thought it was really good. I thought, um, you know, aside from the things that I mentioned, just that kind of took me out a a little bit and, and being confused for a second, probably mostly just because I'm slow, but it was ultimately the, again, the process of watching both these characters go through the steps that they had to go through to get to their, their outcomes I found pretty fascinating and, and um, enjoyed it quite a bit. Yeah. Michael Lonsdale, Edward Fox, fantastic jobs by both those guys. Yep. Um, All right. Should we talk a little, uh, there's not a lot of information. We'll talk a little bit of box office glory. Yeah. Sounds good. All right, our final box office glory of season five. Okay, the day of the jackal opens up May. I I see May sixteenth. <laughs> I see May eighteenth, nineteen seventy three in the UK. It op- ends up opening July in the US. Um, it did uh, sixteen million domestically. Uh, don't and I d- was not able to find how much the budget was uh, for this. So. Uh, but pro- I'm assuming this is a, this is a profit. It doesn't seem like it's a very expensive movie. You don't have a lot of cast. Um, you do have a lot of locations, uh, but a uh, pretty straightforward shoot. So um, it totals up at number 16 of 1973, right between a touch of class and ahead of High Plains Drifter. Oh. How about that? Which is definitely a movie we're going to cover uh, at some point here. I've uh, never actually seen it. Oh, High Plains Drifter. Mm. Wait, I think, yes, that's Clint Eastwood, yeah? Yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah, love yeah. that movie. Uh, okay, and uh, 1973, top of the box office is The Exorcist, The, the Sting, with our, our dear favorite Paul Newman, and American Graffiti. Hmm. Richard Dreyfuss. Oh, with, don't say those words, David. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> with Dicky Dreyfus. <laughs> there you go. Uh, okay, so yeah, those are you know big movies up there at the top. But number sixteen, that's not too far off. So it's a top twenty movie, almost a top fifteen. <clears throat> it's true. There you go. Oh, <laughs> awesome. It, there yeah. it is. It, there. <laughs> it does all right. It's been box office. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been reconsinimized. <laughs> um, no. Well, I had a lot of fun uh, looking back at this one. I was I've been wanting you guys to watch this movie for a while, so I'm glad we finally made it happen. Finally, I'm I'm 
I'm very happy with this. <laughs> so does this does this knock assassins out off the you know mantle, uh, David? As far as your favorite assassin film? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Okay, it's it's you know that's still a fun, sexy movie, but that one is the, the, the sexier version for sure. Yeah. It is. It is the sexier version. <laughs> uh, but this one, no, this uh, this is this is how you do it. This is yeah. a good story. Yeah. Well, yeah, this was uh, great. Great looking back at this one, and we've had a, a great fifth year on the show. So much fun with you guys. Uh, we had a lot of guests this year. We had our, some of our favorites. We had E.K. Wimmer. We had uh, Joe Seta was with us looking back at uh, A Christmas Story, right? And uh, mm-hmm. Noises Off as well. Mm-hmm. All of those you can dig out in the archives where, uh, at reconsidermation.com. Uh, uh, Jay Blake Fischera joined us a couple of times uh, looking at Christine and looking at the Wraith. And uh, we've... Uh, I'm looking forward to having all those guys and more return or join us for the first time for season six of reconsideration. Yeah. Season six is going to be awesome. Yeah. We got some, some crazy movies lined up. Some, some big ones. We're going to continue looking at some, some lesser known films as well, but ones we're going to have a really good time with. So stay tuned for that. I'm Uh, I'm ready for Jason takes Manhattan. That's that's coming. That's the one. I'm excited. It's, it's next up on our Friday the Thirteenth uh, train. So, yes, yeah, we're we're gonna have a fun fun year. So, thank you everyone for listening. A uh, quick shout out and thank you to our friends, uh, EK Wimmer for the theme music, and Curtis Moore for the poster. Uh, appreciate you guys very much. Uh, you can check us out. We're on social media. We're on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook at Reconsideration Podcast. Check out our archives at reconsideration.com and uh, give us a five star review on Apple Podcasts. It uh, it always helps. It helps boost the profile of the show. We always appreciate that. Um, what else, guys? Anything else? Uh, last words for season five? Um, Go watch no, Day man. of the Jackal. Yeah. yeah, get that jackal. If you haven't, check it out yeah yeah uh other than that no be you know be 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 nice and be cool and good luck out there it's it's a it's a dangerous world with assassins afoot <laughs> it is you're assassins right about everywhere. That. there's jackals all over Absolutely. high fives for everybody <laughs> should we leave them with the the announcement of what our our uh, premiere for season six is going to be because i i just can't wait are you ready uh, I know you're ready. I'm, I'm ready. It's going okay. to be Mega Force. Get jacked. See, see you then, I'm just, guys. I'm hearing <laughs> everyone react right now all over the world. Jaws <laughs> drop. People are, are a gasp. They're just, they don't know what to make of themselves. Mega That's Force a- is the one that everyone's, that everyone's been waiting for. Yeah. We're going we're gonna to wrap up season five with realism. <laughs> with Day of the Jackal, and we're going to kick it off with just insanity with the classic uh, Megaforce, Barry Bostwick-led classic. So uh, stay tuned. We're going to have a very special guest on with us. Uh, And thank you guys very much again for staying with us for five seasons, and here's to another 53. Let's go. (laughs) Going to have to read the lease. We'll see you guys next season on Reconcinimation. Take care. Bye now.